Some of these oscillatory states will be rendered massless particles due to them being in the zero energy state. Another state with spin 2 is observed and is also known as the graviton. The masses of the massive string states are of the order m is equal or bigger than 1 to ls. String interactions gets introduced by letting the strings touch each other and then get attached into one single string. These are basically the joining and splitting interactions of strings. The simplest of string theories are the ones that live in 10 dimensions and are observed to be supersymmetric. The sum of a string theory which are emphasized with Feynman diagrams can be performed and yields finite results. At considerable low energies to the likes of energies lower than mass of the massive string stays the only excitation we will have are gravitons and other massless particles. The interactions of these particles are those of some massless fields and also of Einstein gravity fields. This is exactly how string theory quantizes the gravity. The description above is nothing except the perturbative quantization of the theory. Field theories also comprise of extended solitons like cosmic string and domain walls or cosmic string. String theory also comprise of solitons and solitons like these are named as D-brains. Primarily, these D-brains have different dimensions than that of the solitons. They may have a point-like shape, D to O main brain, one-dimensional D to one brain, two-dimensional D to two brain, etc. Solitons have a specific description in string theory. Their excitations are described by open strings that end on them. When we put many brains together, the open strings have two indices, I and J, labeling the brain where they start and the brain where they end. For both the cases concerned, the parameters of the standard model would heavily be depended on the brain configuration or the internal manifold. The compactifications that are done to preserve two, four or eight supersymmetries at very low energies are accounted for to a great extent. In the particular situation where a single supersymmetry is preserved is not that well accounted for and hard for us to understand how the supersymmetry can even be broken like it happens in the real world without generating a very big cosmological constant as big as crossing the supersymmetry breaking scale. This the greatest hurdle while explaining how the standard model is embedded in the string theory idea of duality had been the source of progress in string theory lately. It is familiar that classical electromagnetism is invariant under the interchange of electric and magnetic fields. This exchanges electric charges with magnetic charges. In field theories, electric charges are carried by fundamental particles and magnetic charges by solitons. When the coupling becomes strong in terms of some variables, the theory has an equivalent description in terms of some dual variables that can be weakly coupled. That is primarily how different string theories are connected to each other. This is the reason why in supersymmetric theories dualities are checked more often than now. Quantities protected by supersymmetry as calculated are the followings. First, Masses and numbers of different protected states that are special, a few charged particles each corresponding to the nature they typically exhibit. Second, effective action of low energy. These are solitons when in dual theory but elementary when under one theory. Black hole entropy. Black holes are one of the most intriguing objects that general relativity predicts. In classical general relativity, black holes have a horizon, which is a surface in space-time such that if somebody crosses it, he or she cannot come back out. For a black hole, in four dimensions, the temperature is inversely proportional to its radius. The fact that they are thermal objects raises very interesting and very important theoretical puzzles. Solving these puzzles is one of the challenges of the theory of quantum gravity. We are used to the fact that when we encounter a thermal object, we can explain its temperature as arising from the motion of the internal constituents. So now the question that stays is, what are the internal constituents of a black hole that explain its temperature? 
This question is often phrased in terms of explaining the microscopic origin of the entropy. The entropy can be defined through the first law of thermodynamics as dm equals t ds. The entropy comes off to be s equals ah to 4gn. Conversely, it can be stated that the entropy is proportion and is fixed and depends on the area of the horizon taken in Planck units. Quantum gravity can very well explain all these entropy effectively. In strings theory, it is hard to calculate this entropy directly since strings describe small fluctuations around flat space while a black hole represents a large deviation from Minkowski space. Recently, when the dynamics of D-brains was understood, it became possible to calculate this entropy for some special cases. Consider a compactification of string theory down to four dimensions that preserves two supersymmetries. In such a theory, we could consider charged black holes. Charged black holes are expected to obey the mass constraint which appears to be like m is equal or bigger than q just to avoid the singularities, something which not accounted for by the horizon. Moving further, the constraint also states that m equals q falls along a very limited representation of the algebra defined by supersymmetry. Not only that, the number of states under that limited representation is independent of any continuous parameters of even coupling. Black holes with m equals q are also special from the point of view of the gravity theory. They are called extremal black holes and for them the Hawking temperature vanishes. In these supersymmetric theories, it is possible to change parameters so that the black hole configuration becomes a weakly coupled system of D brains and strings whose entropy one can calculate fairly easily. The answer, of course, comes out to be the same as the area of the corresponding black hole solution. Since the number of BPS states does not change when we do this transformation, this provides a derivation of black hole entropy for these special black holes in these supergravity theories. The entropy of general black holes in completely general string backgrounds cannot be calculated with the present techniques. On former theories and anti spacetimes, space-times, Although string theory was described above as a theory of quantum gravity, it originated as an attempt to describe hadrons. The string description explains some features of the hadron spectrum, such as reg trajectories, etc. We now know that hadrons are described by QCD, but it is still quite hard to do computations at low energies due to strong coupling problems. In fact, we expect confinement. Confinement is tough to arise from the fact that the color electric field lines form narrow bundles in going from a quark to an antiquark. These fluxes look at low energies like strings and one might expect that at low energies a description in terms of string might be valid. It was shown by T. Hooft that the proper way to most precisely the number of states that cannot be combined into larger representations, such as the ones with m is bigger than q, remains invariant. In supersymmetric theories, these are BPS states and their number does not depend on the coupling, so we can calculate the black hole entropy by counting the number of states in the gas of D brains and strings. Fluxes of the color electric field forms a narrow bundle leading to a linear potential and confinement of Young-Mills theory with n equals 4 supersymmetries and a large number of colors. And it has been conjectured that these gauge strings are the same as the fundamental strings described above but moving in a particular curved spacetime. The product of five-dimensional antidesitaire space and a five-sphere. 5-dimensional add S has a boundary which is 4-dimensional. The field theory is defined on this 4-dimensional boundary. There have been a large number of checks for this correspondence. Many checks are possible due to the large number of supersymmetries. The simplest check is the observation that both theories have the same symmetries. N equals 4 supersymmetric. All these form the group mathematically known as SO24. This group is the group of isometries of ADS. Similarly, the Young-Mills theory has an SO6 global symmetry group, which is the same as the group of rotations of S5. 
In fact, when we consider string theory on ADS minus 5 times S5, we also have the same supersymmetries as the gauge theory. Something that has enough material to puzzle is that the field theory doesn't take gravity into consideration unlike bulk theory, which typically does. Going by the bulk theory, gravity resembles the stress tensor as given in the boundary and it is explained as follows. In agreement, Einstein argued against the existence of black holes and singularities, but they have become accepted among established physics. The black hole has been modified for it to emit Hawking radiation, but the singularity aspect of it remains part of accepted theory whereby interpretation of the limiting aspect of light speed with regard to gravity allows for conditions of infinite mass energy density within an infinitesimal space of no definable volume. Infinity is generally a mathematical problem in relating laws of physics to the observable world. Each operator corresponds to a particle or more precisely a string mode propagating in ADS. In the same way, anti-quark quark potential can easily be determined just by a simple string consideration which passes through two separate points situated at the boundary. This can be illustrated with a diagram whereby movements of strings are traced on a ten-dimensional space. These moving strings are true representations of the fluxes of color fields. We can thus say that strings made of gluons look very much like ordinary fundamental strings. It was a problem relating the thermal light energy ultraviolet catastrophe until Planck introduced the quantum. It continued to be a problem with quantum physics until the principle of renormalization was applied. In relation to the quantum, there is also another problem with the aspect of special relativity stipulating no information of events transmit faster than light speed. A mathematical singularity is defined as two terms of an equation, one indicating zero magnitude and the other infinity. This potential is not confining and it should not be since the field theory is conformal. It is possible to deform the field theory in such a way that one destroys conformal invariance and supersymmetry at low energies. The theory which is brought over as a result is much expected to be the confining one. Even though the theory is confining, it is not pure young mills, it is a strongly coupled version of it. In order to find the large n limit of pure young mills, one needs to consider strings propagating in a curved spacetime whose curvature is of the order of the string scale. In this situation, the gravity approximation would not be good enough. Treating strings as these small spaces is a challenging problem which is being explored. It is harder to use it in this direction since the field theory is strongly coupled and therefore hard to solve. There are, however, some general statements that one could make. One of the most mysterious objects in a gravity theory is a black hole. One can consider a black hole in ADS. This black hole is, in principle, described by some thermal state in the boundary theory. The increase in mass energy is further shown to be conserved by an exchange of energy between systems. For an analogy, a relative increase in mass of the gravitational field in addition of it entering into the field should constitute work energy spent with regard to an increase in gravitational force from an increase in relative mass density. As the field increases in mass, it should radiate energy. In the case of ADS-3, it is possible to precisely determine the entropy as per the techniques given in field theory and the result, hence achieved, conforms with the idea of gravity. Holography says that in a quantum theory of gravity we should be able to describe physics in some region of space by a theory with at most one degree of freedom per unit of Planck area. It is worth nothing that the degree of freedom with their numbers shows rising with the area instead of the volume, which is something we are used to normally. Of course, for all physical systems that we normally encounter, the number of degrees of freedom is much smaller than the area, since the Planck length is so small. It is called holography because it would be analogous to a hologram which can store a three-dimensional image in a two-dimensional surface. In this case, we represent the physics of the five-dimensional antidesitaire spacetime with a theory that lives on its boundary. It is a concrete example of holography. 
understanding it better might lead to more insights about quantum gravity. Causes of Gravitation Newton formulated gravitational force according to his inverse square law, but he was unable to explain the cause of gravity other than by an action at a distance principle. Einstein explained gravity as mass energy following the path of space-time curvature due to the presence of mass, but more entailed explanation of how the presence of mass causes space-time curvature is still lacking. Here, gravity has been associated with the Hubble constant in so far as a minute decrease in radiant energy with regard to its propagation in the medium of space allows for a long-range effect of a relatively weak force of gravity per mass in comparison to such other forces of nature as atomic and electromagnetic. However, although a vacuum effect is possible in the wake of emitted radiation, there is yet adequate explanation as to how a restoring force maintains the equilibrium state of local mass in manner of conserving momentum in the process. Explanation is here given in view of a virtual vacuum condition that is now an integral part of quantum physics. It assumes gravitational radiation is consistent with the tired light mechanism of space, whose main objection is a lack of explanation as to how space can decrease the energy of light and allow the visibility of the distant stars. How this visibility is possible is thus given explanation along with conservation of momentum. Electromagnetism is part of the visibility explanation with regard to a right-hand rule and a more causal explanation of interaction between virtual particles than as originally proposed by Feynman with limited explanation. For instance, no casual explanation of how virtual particles cause attraction was deemed necessary according to Feynman. An explanation is here given as more casual with the inclusion of a concept of zero-point energy, ZPA, which Planck later proposed as a modification of his original formulation of the quantum. The ZPA was further expanded on to include a Casimir effect as a method of attraction which includes interaction of virtual particles for further explanation. Gravitational radiation, gravitons, emitted for gravitational effect also are virtual particles, but the explanation includes more in-depth analysis of the method of radiation superimposing to form observable mass as consistent with how mass relates to both relative motion and gravity. Vacuum Effects It has been argued primary substance would dissipate into empty space without any internal mechanism to form into particles if space were partially empty. Whether space is only partially filled or is a plenum, quantum theory now describes vacuum space as containing virtual energy, particles, according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Such virtual particles as gluons are to explain observable effects that do not otherwise comply with predictions of theory. The gluon is confined as part of a proton or neutron such that it cannot be observed directly as an individual particle apart from a proton or neutron. It is verifiable only as an indirect effect according to mathematical analysis. It thus seemingly exists as a virtual particle. In general, the vacuum of space is now assumed to contain an assortment of virtual particles. The quantum vacuum condition is not here contested. It is expanded to include non-quantum conditions of continuous change in motion as well. Matter at rest absorbs and emits discrete units of electromagnetic radiation as quanta, but quanta also vary according to the Doppler principle. Relative motion, gravity and electric charge all comply with the Doppler principle of continuous change in effect. Electrostatic and gravitational effects are explained as vacuum effects occurring in the wake of emitted radiation. Even though effects are visible, gravitons are virtual particles. Although ordinary light is a visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, as X-rays and radio waves are directly detectable, virtual particles can explain electromagnetic effects as well. Both gravity and electromagnetism thus associate with a virtual vacuum cause and effect of electromagnetic radiation, whether virtual or not. The virtual explaining of electromagnetic effects is in view of Feynman diagrams. 
The continuous change in force is explained in accordance with the concept of zero-point energy. Planck proposed to modify his own quantum theory for it to comply with the classical theories of continuous change. His effort was continued with proposed casual explanations of the particle wave paradox by de Broglie, a hidden variable approach by David Bohm, and a stochastic interpretation of quantum probability conditions by Jean-Pierre Vigier. It includes the concept of ZPE. The absorption of energy by the field implies space-time itself contain energy. There is a virtual field of vacuum energy in space free of matter in accordance with the probability condition of quantum physics. If matter is an anomaly of space-time as a finite universe then its gravitational work energy could be in a state of equilibrium whereby the laws of thermodynamics are maintained. There is neither increase nor decrease of total energy and total entropy of the universe. However, systems within it still need to conform to conservation laws. Energy is conserved by mutual exchange between systems, but a local change in a system changes the view of the universe at large. If an observer relatively at rest with the universe at large accelerates, whereby the universe is then perceived to have greater internal motion relative to the new state of the observer, then mass energy of the universe relatively increases, unless a relative decrease in relative motion occurs to the relative increase in relative motion. Such a condition, referred to as a cosmological principle, is in effect with regard to assuming the content of the universe is finite and expanding. Moreover, if the gravitational field contracts to be a singularity of infinite mass density and the mass energy of observers in it contract relatively the same, then the mass energy of the universe at large remains relatively the same. However, the same principle of maintaining relative mass energy density should apply to an expanding universe as well. Consistency of theory is at stake. Universe's expansion if it starts from the point of singularity, then it should be increasing in mass energy, which is now evident of an increased expansion rate. Zero-point energy Planck revolutionized physics in the year 1900 with the introduction of the quantum as a solution to an infinity paradox of black body radiation, but he did not accept some of its implications. He continued to pursue a more consistent solution with classical electromagnetism. He contrived a possible solution in 1911 that assumed quantum effects are the particular oscillation mode of the atom. However, his assumption contrasted with Bohr's atomic theory whereby quantum jumps of discrete energy occur with absorption of radiation as well as its emission. In effect, the continuous manner of change in the relative motion of mass only occurs by reflecting radiation instead of by its absorption or emission. However, a particular aspect of Planck's new theory did receive recognition. Planck added the term 1 to 2 hv to his original equation relating energy of radiation to absolute temperature. He referred to this term as the zero-point energy of an oscillator such that the average energy at absolute temperature zero is not itself zero. Wolf and Nurst 1864-1941, who had formulated the third law of thermodynamics, reinterpreted the term in consideration of the possible heat death due to the loss of radiation emitted out of the universe. He compared the half quantum frequency 1 to 2 hv to temperature kbt, where kb is the Boltzmann constant also used for statistical analysis of the classical theory of kinetics. Further consideration of Planck's additional term became evident in view of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in that otherwise zero energy at absolute zero temperature contradicts the principle in referring to possible determination of exact energy for any particular time. Any possible frequency of radiation suggests there is a possible infinite magnitude of ZPE. However, the uncertainty principle further suggests an infinite magnitude of energy is undetectable with regard to a particular time and location being uncertain. A possibility of this uncertainty is explainable as invisible effects of interaction between virtual energies as similar to how thermodynamic entropy is explainable as no change occurring between two systems of the same temperature. For instance, 
Gravity is essentially invisible, except for its gravitational effect, because it is able, along with light waves in general, to occupy the same space, whereas matter supposedly cannot. Such invisibility is typical of wave action. Waves superimpose to produce visible effect only if the medium of wave action changes in a way it can be seen. If action within a medium of interaction is counterbalanced, the direct change occurring within the interaction need not be seen beyond it. A connection between ZPE and continuous change is with regard to a particle wave paradox. The photoelectric effect revealed that electrons freed by radiation are according to frequency instead of the intensity of radiation. Einstein explained this result as particle effects of electromagnetic radiation. The particles were referred to as photons, as distinguished from particles of matter. However, further experimental evidence of interference supported a wave interpretation of light, and the photoelectric effect can be explained as according to light frequency instead of light intensity. Frequency is also a wave property. A higher frequency of light, instead of less frequent but more intense light of the same energy, can free electrons because higher frequency does not allow enough time for the interaction to respond, being inelastic in emitting electrons of particular energies. A higher frequency light of less intensity thus requires a quicker response for elastic consequence even though it occurs less often per interaction. Einstein later offered an explanation of photons guided by waves. The waves would be directly invisible to us, but a particle guided by a packet of waves interfering within themselves could explain the particle wave duality. With regard to the existence of the particle, the Broly considered particle effects as resulting from overlapping waves in analogy to the beats of sound occurring from sound waves. Schrödinger then developed de Broly's idea in a consistent manner of Planck's attempt to relay the quantum to classical electrodynamics and relativity theory. Moreover, in 1954, Bohm and Vigier mathematically developed a casual wave particle duality explanation, but the stricter indeterminism interpretation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle prevailed instead in only explaining effects in accordance with conditions of probability with no further need of causal explanation. More support for zero-point energy is according to a Casimir effect. It was proposed in 1947 by Hendrik B. G. Casimir, 1909-2000. He and Dirk Potter, 1919-2001, experimented with metallic plates for the measure of the van der Waals force between the plates and their polarized molecules. They discovered an attractive force between the plates if they were close enough. Niels Bohr had suggested to Casimir that the experiments could relate to ZPE. Casimir complied with Bohr's suggestion by formulating a theory in 1948. Experimental evidence as accurate to within 15% of the predicted value of theory came much later in 1997 by Steve K. Lamoureux. More accurate results followed. However, exact results require experimental conditions to the extreme, such as an exact vacuum condition and perfectly smooth walls. The Casimir effect in relation to ZPE is interpreted in accordance with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which applies to the quantum vacuum in further reference to quantum wave mechanics. Assuming the vacuum is comprised of waves of any possible frequency, equilibrium conditions vary according to arrangements from which waves fluctuate in and out of phase. Two superposing waves in opposite phase can momentarily cancel effect. If the volume of space between walls is relatively small, such that momentary loss of energy allows the walls to momentarily contract, then wave energy as a virtual particle reappears outside the volume between the walls in allowing for the existence of a new state of equilibrium. Interpretation with regard to virtual particles is that they are emitted due to their relative confinements in space for an immediate response to outside pressure in preventing another virtual particle to replace the emitted one. The conditions of inelasticity and frequency are thus again applicable. The greater frequency is again in play, but with different results. 
Even though the direct interaction of frequency is still inelastic, contraction of the system occurs, instead of it simply losing electrons. Virtual spin and the right-hand rule In relation to the Feynman diagrams, there are particles responsible for attraction and repulsion. Virtual particles repel electrons from electrons and protons from protons, and they attract electrons to protons and protons to electrons. Various effects arise. For example, discovery of ampere could be cited here, where two parallel wires are observed to contract as long as both have electric current flowing in the same direction and they also repel if the flow of currents in them is in opposite direction. The Feynman diagrams suggest an explanation according to virtual particles, which is here to be included, but it is itself an underlying explanation for a right-hand rule explanation. The right-hand rule explanation of electrical attraction and repulsion is in connection with the polar property of magnetism. A magnet is polarized whereby like poles repel each other and opposite poles attract each other. If the magnet is divided, each part obtains opposite poles. The right-hand rule, which is a result of experiment, describes a right-hand palm facing a current with a thumb pointing in the direction of the current, directed perpendicularly towards the direction in which the fingers point. The opposite poles of two currents flowing in the same direction thus align closer to each other to attract, whereas like poles tend to align closer to each other to repel if the current flow is exactly in opposite direction of the other. Why, beyond experiment, is there a right-hand rule? Likely, explanation is with regard to chiral symmetry by which the electron spins in a direction opposite to the proton spin. The electron being less massive than a proton requires electrons to maintain relative motion after interacting with protons of opposite spin. The opposite spins move in the same direction when they touch each other, which results in vibrant motion through the wire for the introduction of a magnetic field in the direction of each spin according to the forward motion of the electron through the wire because of it being of less mass than the proton mass. Physicists have cautioned that automatic spin is not the same as that of a spinning ball. Nonetheless, circular directions of magnetic fields from a bar magnet is verified by the use of a compass. A bar magnet is the polarization of positive and negative charges from which electrons are propelled from one pole and attracted to the other pole. They thus tend to circle around from the positive pole to the negative pole. How polarization of two opposite charges exists is not yet explained. They are to be explained as the emission of virtual particles in view of the electric currents flowing through wires. Explanation of this contraction and repulsion is according to the law of momentum and the emission of virtual particles. The electrons flowing in the same direction tend to emit virtual particles with more total momenta in the same direction and less total momenta perpendicular to the stationary wires. The virtual particles, in turn, collide to emit secondary virtual particles in the perpendicular direction to those of the wires. Secondary collisions are of less energetic virtual particles if they are moving more partly in the same direction of motion than if they move more partly in opposite directions of motion. Regard this explanation as fundamental on a primary level from which attraction and repulsion become functional on subatomic and atomic levels. There could also be an opposite alignment according to a left-hand rule which would constitute antimatter. The worlds often interact, whereby one is an anomaly of the other. It's been widely observed that physics, without considering the laws of gravitation using the quantum rules, is not as consistent as it should be. Hence, the necessity for proper application of quantum mechanics and its theories, in particular, are very much in need to understand concepts such as Big Bang theory and so on. With that said, I must bring it up here that all the principles, formulas, that was discussed in this script so far must be combined together, which is a method known as unification. 
Combining them even more actually includes the Clausius principle of mean free path for explaining why internal motion of the molecules does not explode in every way. The direct matrix, along with wave mechanic, the Stefan Boltzmann fourth power law, as well as Einstein's momentum energy tensor matrix. Altogether, gives us the complete picture of the field we are studying. The Stefan Boltzmann fourth power law, which is most dealing with an increase in temperature of electromagnetic radiation, but then again, heat and temperature relate to the kinetic energy of gases as well. A fourth power ratio of nuclear mass to that of its electron mass of the hydrogen element atom is perhaps a consistent interpretation of the Stefan Boltzmann fourth power law. The deeper and detailed interpretation of this applies to Einstein's momentum energy tensor matrix. A relativistic increase in the ratio of potential energy to internal energy is in the ratio to C4 if there is no relativistic increase in the internal energy. It simply signifies a comparison of mass in relative motion and or a gravitational field to that relatively at rest in gravitational free space as an underlying principle of the virtual field. But it does not appear to unify theory in the manner that the Dirac matrix does. The connection between general relativity and the Dirac matrix is with regard to invariance and the fraction 1 to 2. The fraction is spin of particles of mass on the atomic scale is of their angular momentum. The fraction relates to gravity as escape speed squared in relation to gravitational potential that that also relates as angular momentum squared or as orbital speed squared. However, on the large cosmic scale, whereby the gravitational field becomes relatively homogeneous, the gravitational potential converts to gravitational escape speed c as a limiting condition, whereby both infinites of gravity and quantum effects both renormalize. It thus appears to be one more step of equating Einstein's and Dirac's matrices. Their interpretation would be similar to the combining of positive and negative charge, but it entails a more inner understanding of the chiral symmetry of matter and antimatter, combining to result in virtual radiation as gravitational radiation. Hence, we can safely say that with the help of strong set of theories combined together, a whole class of phenomena is studied and understood, as was expected in any theory of quantum gravity. Many connections were found between different string theories and between string theory and field theory. It has been shown that string theory reduces, in certain circumstances, to ordinary four-dimensional field theories and vice versa. We hope that in the near future, we will understand the theory better so as to make contact with experiment.